Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our uh, Sabbath School presentation uh, uh, this morning, uh, series number 10. And uh, we are about to finish our quarter, uh, a few Sabbaths more, and then uh, we are done with the, uh, the book of Genesis. Uh, uh, in, in, in order for us to uh, uh, suggest and uh, digest uh, the whole uh, story today, uh, we need also to talk about the precedent, uh, what that story is, what happened before. So, but before we begin, uh, let's have a word of prayer. The Lord is morning. Uh, thank you again for uh, uh, this opportunity and a blessing that we can have this study and uh, be able to uh, present in details uh, some subjects or, or details that we need to learn more about uh, the life and, and story of the Jacob and his family and what happens after. Uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, guiding us and help us to understand this in our uh, blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, Jacob, Israel. Uh, as you see the picture, uh, the idea of, uh, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> the idea of the story is that, uh, uh, <coughs> but before we go in there, let me give you some a preview of what's going to uh, we're, we're going to discuss here. Uh, we are going to deal with wrestling with God. That means Jacob wrestling with God, and the brothers meet, meaning Esau and Jacob is going to meet after this, and the violation of Dinah and prevailing idolatry and the death of Rachel. And so, uh, if in this context here, we can see. Uh, Jacob was finally back to the promised land. Now he had to confront the rage of his brother Esau because of his past mistakes. And we talked about last uh, Sabbath where uh, the trigger of his going back home to the promised land was the birth of his son Joseph. And uh, of course the youngest son was born on the way. And so uh, he asked God's uh, and his brother's forgiveness and he became a new man, Israel. So uh, some issues arose within his family. So he encouraged them to abandon all idolatry and to embrace a covenant with God. So uh, Jacob is forgiven, becomes Israel, God's forgiveness in Genesis 32, and human's forgiveness in Genesis 33. And uh, family issues, there is violence breeds violence abandoning idolatry and the death of Rachel. So uh, if you look at uh, this uh, preview here, it's kind of uh, up and down story. And uh, so uh, in order for us to uh, uh, <coughs> deal with this, uh, the family saga of Jacob continues both good and the bad. Yet through it all, the hand of God and his faithfulness to the covenant promises is revealed. So let's not forget how God deals with Jacob in this instance because God is in the middle of all this saga that is going on with his personal life and his family and also, of course, his brothers. So he said here in, we are going to deal at Genesis 32 down to Genesis 36. And so he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob. But Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And this is our key text today. So uh, Jacob is now, a free, is now a free man from uh, Laban. Under God's blessing, uh, Jacob has become rich. It seems that he at last was happy. He has reached his goal and he's heading home to Canaan. Yet Jacob is profoundly worried about this future in Canaan and the threat posed by his brother. It is precisely at this moment that God chose to approach Jacob. The extraordinary confrontation will radically change the character of Jacob. As a result, Jacob is renamed Israel. Jacob's encounter with God at Peniel corresponds to his Bethel encounter the two accounts echo each other in words, structure, and themes. While Bethel begins at sunset, Peniel ends at sunrise. 
with a prospect of glorious future. After a night of wrestling, Jacob emerges from his encounter with a blessing and a new name. He has a personal encounter with God of love and leave. In turn, Jacob is able to look upon the face of his enemy, his brother Esau, in humility and love. Then Jacob turns to his family and confronts inequity, the rape of Dinah, his daughter, the murders committed by his sons, and finally the idolatry that was still prevailing in his household. So uh, that is uh, in, the, uh, in our Sunday's uh, discussion, he wrestling with God, distraught by fear, knowing that his brother Esau is coming, and with 400 men, Genesis 32-6, Jacob has another encounter reminiscent of his encounter with God in Bethel in chapter 28. Why is the whole event described in such detail? The biblical narrative seldom divulges the inner thoughts of characters, but here it does in chapter 32, verse 8 and 32, verse 20. What are the differences in Jacob's prayer in chapter 28 and chapter 32? So uh, chapter 32 is a story of Jacob's struggle. And so let's uh, send this uh, uh, in here. <coughs> uh, in, uh, <coughs> in Genesis 28, 22, this was his prayer uh, on his uh, running away from uh, his family when Esau was uh, threatening him to, you know, to kill him after his deception, getting the blessings of his father. And he said, in, uh, it, this was in the Bethel in his, when he was dreaming uh, between, you know, uh, that the ladder between the earth and heaven uh, descending, ascending, as descending angels. And then when he woke up, said, then Jacob made a vow saying, if, you know, just, if God be with me, and will watch over me in this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household. Then the Lord will be my God. And the stone that I have set up as pillar will be God's house. And all that you gave me, I will give you a tent. Now that was, that was the, the, the uh, thinking of Jacob. If God will be with me. Now, after uh, 20 years uh, from, you know, after 20 years later, uh, Jacob uh, now decided us to go back to, to uh, uh, the land of promise, Canaan, where his father and mother was, and his brother too. And so, uh, during the struggle, the, he said, then Jacob prayed, O oh God, my father Abraham. If you notice this, he now saying that, O oh God, my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown me, your servant. I had only a staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the son of the sea, which cannot be counted. If you notice, there is a change of tone. In, in, in Bethel, he said, if God will be with me, and then going back, then Jacob prayed, O oh God, of my father Abraham. You see, uh, that is uh, a growing maturity. And yet he is still afraid, afraid. In going back to the land of Canaan, he prayed that, uh, you know, uh, save me, I pray from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid. He hasn't, you know, he hasn't gone over the guilt, what he did to his brother Esau, when he, you know, uh, uh, manipulated, uh, you know, getting the blessings of the first son. And uh, actually, you know, it was supposed to be his, and yet, uh, you know, he went ahead and do it in the wrong way. 
So this is one of the issues that we need to think about because the narrator, the narrator is that the angels of God whom Jacob had seen in his dream ascending and descending peacefully on the ladder, Genesis 20:12, are now threatening him. They clash with him. The verb haga met in Genesis 32 verse 1 has connotations of violence. It expresses the surprising and aggressive character of an encounter. Jacob is shocked, you know, and he feels as he is back at Bethel where he was afraid. And he calls this place Manahim, meaning two camps, referring to two groups of angels, you know, on going up and other going down. The words also reminds us of religious dance featuring choreography that may have evoked the two camps of Jacob's dream. In uh, Manaim is uh, also a place where camp of, De- camp of David uh, would fight the camp of Saul and where David would later decide to reconcile with his enemy. Uh, so Jacob's distress uh, inspires the prophet Jeremiah regarding the dreadful condition of Israel in exile. Yet beyond the particular event, the language of the prophet clearly suggests that he has in view the future eschatological day of the Lord. Daniel applies the same expression referring to distress, trouble, chara, to the time of the end in Daniel 12.1. And Jacob's distress derives from two causes. The first is horizontal and related to his brother. The second is vertical and relates to God. Jacob's first concern is with his brother, uh, to whom he sends to companies of messengers. The initiative is strategic operation to safeguard the second camp. In uh, the event of the first camp is attack, the second camp will have time to escape, and Jacob decides to send two camps of messengers to Esau, and Jacob calls his two camps of human messengers by the name Maknani Camps. Jacob understands that in order to recover his relationship with God, he must restore his relationship with his brother. And so this is very important. Jacob remains alone because he wants to pray in anguish of spirit for God's intervention and protection. While he prays, a man in Genesis 32, 24, approaches him, and Jacob, thinking he is being attacked by an enemy, begins to wrestle with the man for his life. The anonymous qualification of the man renders a mysterious identity of this person. Jacob will identify the man as God, later in 32, 30. As well, the prophet of Isaiah in 12, 3, 4, the same language will be used by Isaiah in description of the suffering servant, that God takes human form in order to relate humans, uh, is not unheard of. So the same term, a man, is used by Daniel to designate the heavenly high priests and commander of the army, an expression that designates the Lord himself. So the information that this man did not prevail contains an important theological lessons about God in his relationship with humans. God's weakness in his confrontation with humans is an expression of his grace and love and the mystery of his incarnation to save humans. The impressions of weakness is immediately contradicted by a man's next move. A simple touch in a, you know, uh, a simple touch is sufficient to produce a dislocation, suggesting superhuman power, the place, the blow, the socket of Jacob's hip, you know, and then which refers to the loin of the, high, of the thigh, is a euphemism for a place associated with procreation. The divine touch is thus an implicit blessing pointing to Jacob's descendants. This practice, therefore, is more than a mere reminder of the story of Jacob. It also recalls the biblical episodes where it, and theological lessons. It also draws 
uh, the meat eater attention to the fundamental principle of sacredness of life. All of these paradoxes convey an important theological lesson. Number one, qualify Jacob's relationship with God depends on equality of relationship with men. In this instance, Esau. Because in the Lord's Prayer, he said, Father, forgive us as we forgive. You know, that, that kind of uh, you know, concept. And number two, the name Israel, God fights, reminds Jacob that he must learn to let God fight for him. Jacob was well prevailed in so far as he will allow God to prevail over him. A principle that will enunciate by Paul when I am weak, then I am strong. Jacob calls the place where God has appeared to him, ben il, which means the face of God. This name signifies Jacob's personal experience, namely that he was confronted by God and survived. And does not mean that Jacob actually saw the physical face of God. This expression is equivalent to seeing the form of the Lord and describes rather than experience of a direct encounter with God. So uh, uh, in Jacob's uh, fight with the mysterious opponent, Reminiscent of Jacob's deception of Isaac, you know, what are the implications of Jacob's self-expression and identity? So what does God actually expect from his children? So in here, we can see that uh, uh, Jacob fight, and so God forgave this. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have rebelled. Why was Jacob afraid of Esau? You know, and so Esau had promised to kill Jacob in Genesis 27, 41. And Jacob wanted to make up with him, but Esau was coming along with 400 men. Jacob prayed and clung to, God, uh, to God's promises. And Jacob couldn't do anything else, so he prayed and asked God's forgiveness. His spiritual struggle became physical, and that's why he struggled and, uh, you know, wrestled with God. And finally, Jacob held on to the man because he realized that he was God himself. Jacob asked for his blessing, and God assured him, you have prevailed. So that is our Sunday's lesson, that he wrestled with God. God has forgiven him. And when we deal with the, brad, the two brothers met here, Monday's lesson thus deals with climactic meeting of the two adversaries. It shows the, the magnanimity from Esau and subservience from Jacob. What was the aftermath encounter in 33, 16 to 20? Who has undergone a more fundamental change? And so uh, let's read the text here in Genesis 33, 1. Jacob looked up there at Esau coming up with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and two female servants. But he put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph at the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times to approach his brother. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around him and kissed him, and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children. Who are these men uh, with you? He asked Jacob, answered. They are the children of God, has graciously given your servant. If you notice this, he is now calling his brother Lord. Uh, and he is now calling himself your servant. And the female servants and the children approached and bowed down. Then Leah, next Leah, and then her children came down and bowed down, and last all came Joseph and Rachel, and the two bowed down. And Esau asked, what's the meaning of these flocks and herds I met to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, he said. Uh, but Esau said, I already have plenty. My brother, keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob. I have, if I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me, for to see your face is like seeing the face of God. 
Now that you have received me favorably, please accept my present that was brought to you. For God is gracious to me, and I have all I need, and because Jacob insisted, is how accepted. Now, if you notice here, uh, when Jacob said, uh, for, for to see your face is like seeing the face of God. Uh, if you notice there, Esau is more lenient and more forgiving. Uh, you know, uh, and to see the change uh, in Esau's character is just like a God's face representing God. That is who God is, very forgiving. And now that you have received me favorably. You know, this is an interesting note that Jacob says that to see uh, your face is like seeing the face of God. Uh, Jacob now is realizing what he had done to his brother. And so Jacob, however, after they separated in verse 17, Jacob, however, went to Sokoth where he built a place for himself and made shelters for livestock. That is why the place is called Sakath. And after Jacob came from Padded Aram, he arrived safely in the city, city of Shechem and Can- in Canaan and come within the site of the city. And 400 pieces of silver he bought from the sons of Hamo, the father of Shechem, the plot of ground where he pitched his tent, where he set all the altar and called it El Elohi Israel. So uh, uh, here... Esau's reluctance to accept uh, his brother's present, Jacob's respond by explicitly connecting his relationship with him to his relationship with God. I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God. Jacob's seen uh, the face of God and uh, in Peniel and the face of Esau. And Jacob's experience with Esau is a second Peniel. You know, and the first Peniel preparing for the second Peniel. Jacob's encounter with God has helped him in his encounter with his brother. And his reconciliation with his brother will affect the relationship with God. And Jacob has come to understand that his love of God and his love of his brother are dependent on its other. Jesus infers this unique theological lesson from the scriptures, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In these two commandments, hang on the law of the prophets. So this experience of Jacob of forgiveness from God and from his brother makes him a different person. You know, this is very important in the context of what he had done before. And yet, you know, uh, Jacob is still uh, did not, you know, did not receive the promised land. He has to buy a lot uh, from, uh, you know, the father of Shechem, a uh, hundred pieces of silver, both from Hamor, the father of Shechem, the plot where he pitched his tent. Now, in order for us to think about this, Human forgiveness, and Jacob said, I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Uh, Jacob had sent some gifts to his brother, also prostrated himself seven times before him. He wanted to make clear that he wasn't going to demand the fulfillment of their father's blessing. And so uh, Esau's reaction astonished Jacob. His brother had forgiven him, and the words had been fulfilled, you have struggled with God and with men, and you have prevailed. And this was the statement of a man that he was wrestling in uh, early in the morning when his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. Now, uh, in order for us to uh, think about this, Jacob had become a new man. He became Israel. He had been forgiven by God and by his brother. He knew he didn't deserve it. This is grace. And this should be uh, our, uh, you know, these are descriptive, but also prescriptive in a sense. Uh, it prescribe how are we going to relate uh, with our uh, human being brothers and sisters in, in this community. And uh, to make sure that 
we are right with God uh, in order for us to realize that our, uh, our relationship with God also affects our relationship with our fellow men, including our brothers and our sisters in the, within the family. You know, the, the family dysfunction uh, now becoming, you know, uh, uh, be, be, becoming better in a sense because of forgiveness. And so, uh, but yeah, that is, is Jacob's uh, trouble, uh, you know, vanished? No, 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 no. Uh, here again, uh, uh, another issue that came in, into his family. I choose this lesson turns to the event of Shechem that involves Dina, Dina. In a book of genealogies and stories that are patriarchal, why is there an entire chapter devoted to Dinah? This chapter contains some of the most detailed and cute character portrayals are found in Genesis. What role does Shechem play in later biblical narratives in Judges, 1 Kings, and then in New Testament, John chapter 4? <clears throat> uh, you know, unfortunately... Human family is not very good at loving neighbors. And the story of Dinah, uh, Jacob's one and only daughter, is one of the most sordid stories in Genesis chapter 34. She is raped by Shechem, the Hittite, and Shechem and his father, uh, hoping to appease his brother's fury, attempt to negotiate a marriage between Shechem and Dinah. Dinah's brother pretend to agree to the marriage under the condition uh, that all males of the city are circumcised. She came and his father present the case to the men of the city, arguing that they will all benefit from the deal. And when the men are circumcised, Dinah brother, Dinah's brothers force their way to the, into their homes and kill all of them and plunder their houses. Wow, uh, this is a sad story. Why is this chapter in here? You know, uh, the narrations of this event suggest incongruities and characters are complex. Neither totally righteous nor totally wicked. They all seemingly act out of good faith. Even their crimes seem justified and appear to be acts of righteousness. The sensual Shechem, the violate that who violates Dinah, is also a loving man who wants to repair the past and agrees to undergo circumcision for love. Simon and Levi, who lie, kill, and plunder, are also those who defend God's commandments, promote circumcision, and resist intermarriages. As for Jacob, he is troubled and frightened. Yet he responds to son's crime with a puzzling and embarrassing silence. Ambivalent of the story has been reflected in the Jewish and Christian interpretation and is explained by the critics as an indication of different sources. But the ambivalence is precisely a mark of the stories of authenticity. Its actors are real and bring to the plot their own contradictions. Somehow God will find his way through the confusion, just as he did in the troubling story of Jacob cheating Esau for the blessing of his father. Today, the lesson still strikes at the hearts of religious men and women. When humans are, no, when humans take God's place and insist in shaping their existence with their own hands, at the expense of God's commandments, the results are problematic, even if the will of God is ultimately fulfilled. The text ends with a significant question posed by Dinah's brothers, seeking justification for their crimes. They pose a question that receives to answer from God. Should he treat our sister like a harlot? Genesis 34-31. Unfortunately, we may perform God's will and be zealous for him, yet be totally disconnected from him. When the mission of God supersedes the reason for our mission, namely the presence of God in our lives, claiming his name and his kingdom become 
veils to justify our lies and our crimes. So, we are using the name of God for violence. And this happens many times in the Christian history. And, you know, the struggle that I have with this story is very, very profound. And yet God was able to deal with this issue. And so, uh, uh, violence breeds violence. And so, say, the sons of Jacob were grieved and were angry. Very, because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought that to be done. Genesis 34, 7. And there are many people who question this uh, kind of story. What kind of God is that? Allowing, you know, to murder the whole community. And yet, you know, this is also uh, a human, human elements that freedom is very important and they made a decision that, uh, you know, uh, they're using the name of God uh, to, to justify uh, their crimes. You know, this is very, very sad, I know. And so uh, Israel finally lived in peace. He bought his first piece of land at Canaan and built an altar to God. And yet uh, peace soon faded away. She came raped Dinah, Jacob's daughter. However, he was willing to make amends. Simeon and Levi wanted everything to go according to God's will. Now, remember Levi? He, he is the tribal priests. And, you know, the, I am trying to, 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 to peace in my mind, uh, you know, God is still willing to work with Levi uh, in the sanctuary system. Nevertheless, as the betrayed, killed, and plundered, Jacob was more worried about the consequence of his son's acts than about the horrible acts themselves. And evidently, God does not approve this. He acted to bring his family to a new relationship with him. So, uh, uh, this is our, uh, and then and Wednesday's lesson, prevailing idolatry. Wednesday's lesson focuses on Jacob's return to Bethel. Only at God's command. What similarities do we find with the first arrival at Bethel? What is the context of putting away the foreign gods in verse, chapter 35, verse 2? What lessons can we learn from this? And so immediately after Jacob's complaint that his peace with Canaanites had been compromised because of what the his two children, uh, two sons did, and after his two sons were rebuked, God urges Jacob to leave Shechem and return to Bethel in order to renew his covenant. Remember Bethel, if God is with me, and now God was with him, and you know, 20 years later, God asked him to go back to Bethel. And Jacob, uh, you know, indeed, the Lord tells him that once he gets there, he needs to build an altar. Meanwhile, the first thing recorded after God's command is Jacob's telling his people to put away the Canaanite idols, which had been taken and plundered the city of Shechem. Now remember, Rachel, you know, uh, brought her idols also uh, from her father's family. But here in Shechem, uh, in, in, in their plan there, they also gather all these idols and household gods had been stolen by Rachel, you know. And this too is a crucial idea of a covenant with God. And the idols had been kept and probably worshipped in spite of Jacob's commitment to God. It was not enough for Jacob to leave. She came in order to escape the Canaanite influence. Jacob had to get rid of the idols within the camp and the hearts of his people. And the process of repentance consists in a more than physical move from one place to another or a move from one church to another. Most important is that we seek by, by God's grace to purge the idolatry in our hearts regardless of where we live. According, uh, because we can make idols 
out of just about anything. When Jacob obeys God and proceeds according to God's commandment, God finally intervenes and the terror of God affects all people around them and they do not dare attack Jacob. Jacob is then ready to worship him and all the peoples who were with him, suggesting that the family unity has been restored. Jacob gives his place the name El Bethel, a reminder of his dream of the ladder, a sign that the connection between heaven and earth, which had been broken for some time, has now been restored. So emphasis this is that the time of, on the God of Bethel rather than on the place of itself. This personal note resonates again when God reminds Jacob of his name Israel, when the double promise that this blessing implies, Jacob's blessing first remains faithfulness, the transmission of the messianic seed and the generations of many nations, and second, it points to the promised land, which is Canaan. So removing, abandoning idolatry was, uh, you know, one of the processes in which Jacob has to do in order to cleanse his community within his household. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. And so God decided to renew his covenant with Jacob. This time all his family would be involved. And so uh, Jacob understood that his family had come to close had come closer to God. He asked them to remove all their idols. The response was unanimous. And God protected them. Jacob built an altar as a reminder of his first encounter with God. And that God, what, what did God's blessing to Jacob Israel include? And then being fruitful and carrying the messianic seed and also processing the promised land. So, the result of that abandoning of idolatry was more blessings and the fulfillment of the promised land, processing of the promised land. Now, our first lesson deals with the death of Rachel. You know, uh, Rachel, now this is now on the 20th year, towards the 21st year, when they were journeying to the, towards the promised land. Thus, this lesson focuses on the death of Rachel, we had a death notice for Sarah. And for Rachel, but for Rebecca, the death of her nurse is provided. Rebecca died without seeing her son Jacob again. I remember 27 uh, when Rachel, uh, when, when Rebecca told Jacob, his son Jacob to go to his brother Laban in, in, in Haran. And Jacob tried to go back there and see his mom again, but no, he did not. And though his first visit to Bethel, Jacob expressed his wish to come again to my father's house. He delayed seeing his father longer than returning to Bethel. He returns 43 years later, just in time for the funeral. What is the significance of that statement? And his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. So, uh, in here we can see the, the death of Rachel was very important in Jacob's life. He is, she is the love of life of Jacob. And so Rachel died and was buried there on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. So uh, Jacob had to face the death of his dear ones. His mother, Rebecca, had died before he returned home. Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died in Bethel. Uh, you know, in, in, in <clears throat> remember that when Rebecca left his uh, 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 family house before going to marry uh, Isaac, uh, uh, was given by his parents a nurse uh, to be with her, to accompany her, and that is Deborah. And so Rachel died in the way to Bethlehem while giving birth to her last son, Benunai, son of my sorrow. Jacob named him Benjamin, son of of the right hand. And so uh, soon after uh, Reuben dishonored his father by sleeping with Belha, 
Israel remained silent. Then put eventually took the birthright away from Reuben because of this. So if you notice, family dysfunction still, you know, takes generations. A psychological impact. You know, it damages a relationship. And still going on, although uh, Jacob uh, has returned to God. That doesn't mean to say that the, the, the family trouble is gone. No, still there because of sin. And so Israel and his family were not perfect. However, God's, God was willing to fulfill his plan with them no matter how imperfect they were. And that's who God is. This is really the story about God too. God is willing in spite of their uh, weaknesses and in spite of their trouble, was willing to walk with them because, you know, he made a covenant. He is faithful. He is faithful to his covenant. And so, uh, uh, although, you know, sometimes there are problems on the way and God is, is patient enough to deal with them. So, uh, uh, in our discussion this morning, in our romantic notions for biblical characters, to serve as role models, heroes must be seen as consistently heroic, and non-heroes as systemic villains. Yet Genesis clearly shows that even heroes have their faults, and non-heroes have their virtues, and these virtues are important to God. Now, if you notice, uh, why did I say this? Because in the story between Jacob and Esau, Esau was more virtuous. He forgave his brothers. And the villains is, you know, uh, the hero that we think is Jacob is, he is, <laughs> he is more, uh, more folk than his, I think, brother in a way. Because, because all these virtues are important to God. And so, uh, you know, uh, this, the story is, you know, God doesn't avoid this kind of stories. He, he, he wrote this story in order for us to realize that God was dealing with humanity that has faults, that has, you know, uh, that has their valence uh, attitude also. And of course, uh, if we study, uh, reflect on chapter 36, and this is the story of Jacob, I mean Esau. Jacob might have been blessed by blessed, but Esau has hardly been cursed. Esau is not chosen, but he is not rejected. Esau too has his blessing, his heritage, his land. He has his children who become kings even before Israelites. And Esau's virtues are recognized, especially his love and respect to his father. What are the implications of seeing ourselves as a chosen people or remnant? You know, uh, we need to, you know, to be very careful of being, you know, <laughs> claiming to be a remnant and yet, uh, you know, there are people who have more virtues uh, than, than ourselves. And so, very important here. And yet, uh, it, uh, this is our last slide here today. Uh, from that night of wrestling, the Jabok Jacob had come forth a different man. Self-confident had been uprooted. Henceforth, the early canning was no longer sin. In place of craft and deception, his life was marked by simplicity and truth. He had learned the lesson of simple reliance upon the Almighty arm. And amid trial and affliction, he bowed his humble submission to the will of God, the faith of Abraham, and Isaac appeared undimmed in Jacob. Wow. The story of a weak human being being used by God as a progenitor of the Messiah is very, very important in this story. Next week, we are going to talk about Joseph. And so, I wish you are here to contribute in our discussion, but, uh, you know, but anyway, uh, if you are around the neighborhood of Redondo Beach, uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church in Southern California, we would like to welcome you to our class discussion during the Sabbath morning. Let's pray. 
Dear Lord, this morning, thank you again for this uh, important discussion about the life of your patriarchs, Jacob, who had been, you know, uh, sometimes up and down in his life, and yet you cling to him because uh, you have promised him to be, a, you know, a blessing to all people around him, a blessing also for generations to come. And may it be that as we think about this, we also help realize, Lord, that uh, Esau was one also of a virtuous person in the story. And let us not uh, allow ourselves to be more self-righteous because there are people who are more virtuous than us. And thank you for that reminder. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.